Thank you very much, Pastor Greg, and uh, I hope you guys do get a meal tonight, and if you don't, you can go ahead and take it out of my hide. I've got plenty, plenty to spare, so. <laughs> so anyways, uh, <laughs> not quite as good as yours, but I'm getting there. Uh, go ahead, and we're going to be in Romans 8 tonight. So let me all ask you this. Oh, Yes. Did you bring your Bibles tonight? Yes. Yes. Did anybody not bring their Bibles tonight? Oh, somebody's going to have to pass Pastor Greg for a piece of candy afterwards. <laughs> I, I did not bring my candy stash with me, although I do have some at home. So, but uh, anyways, Romans 8, we're going to be in Romans uh, 8, 5 through 8 tonight. That's going to be our home, home verses tonight. So I'm just going to go ahead and read them so we can get an idea of where we're going here. So... And I'm reading out of NASB, but if you've got New King James, that's fine. They both get the same message across. Here we go. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the, I'm sorry, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So I've titled this sermon tonight, Keeping the Mind Clean. And you're asking, where am I going this? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, what does your mind do as far as uh, just waking up, going about your day and day life? What does your mind do? Wanders, okay. What else? Analyze, okay, I like that word. What else? <laughs> autopilot, sometimes we do set it on autopilot as well. So one of the things uh, I was kind of going for tonight is our mind is a filter. I mean, it takes in all the five senses that we have, and it processes it, stores it, and sends it on down to our heart. And, you know, sometimes, like, uh, we see things, smell things we like, we prioritize those things, and things we don't like, like skunk on the road or some bad smell or some bad memory, we tell our mind, forget it, put it out of the way. But that's what our mind does. And what I want us to see here tonight is one of the key words here uh, in Romans uh, 5 through 8 is that setting your minds. Because when you get up in the morning, you always, whether you think about it consciously or not, you set yourself a priority for that day. Like, I'm going to make sure that I get up. Or I'm going to make sure that I get all I can done at work. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I get my favorite meal. You name it. But that's one thing that you do when you get up is you set your mind, you prioritize your mind to do something. And one of the things I want us to see here in Romans 8 is that there's two con you, we basically have two ways we can set our mind when we get up, just generally. One, we can set up our minds to basically think do something physical, worldly. It doesn't even have to be sinful, but we may set our minds to, I'm going to get something done in the physical realm. The other way is you can set up your mind saying, I am going to do something for God today. And those are the two kind of, kind of priorities that you can set your mind up to. And what Paul is saying here in Romans 8 is that when you set your mind to something physical, even if you have no intention of sinning, what happens when you prioritize okay, I'm going to do something physical, you're putting yourself in a position to where you may veer off and sin, even if you don't intend to, but you're putting yourself in a position where it's easier to sin. And when you set your mind as a priority of something on the Spirit, on God, then you're setting yourself up saying, I'm going to do something for God today, and I don't want anything to interrupt that. So, one, so what I want you guys to get in the habit of doing is when you get up in the morning or whenever you start your day, whether it's after the 15th cup of coffee or uh, after you've gotten the kids out of the house, whatever, set your priority, just as we see here in Romans, is that set yourself 
up for success, as we would say, by doing something for God. Because when you do that, you're going to be setting your mind to, okay, I want to do something for God. Where can I do this? That's what I want you kind of th- to think, that I want to set up a priority of doing something for God. And, um, But also in, in that uh, scenario, remember that God always tests us because as children of God, God is always testing us, refining us, making, making sure that, hey, do you know how good you are serving me or if you're not serving me? So that's one thing I, um, I, I want you to see as we turn to Jeremiah 17.10 because that's where we're going to see how God um, tests us. And here we go in 17.10. I'll read it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give each man according to his ways. Now, one thing I want to ask you, a little participation here, what is the purpose of a test? Someone give me an answer. What's the purpose of a test? Carl. Uh, Okay. Something else. Okay, to evaluate. Anything else? To develop. To develop. Okay, very good. And those are all um, excellent examples of how a test is for our benefit, even though most of the times when we hear about tests, we're like, oh, I've got to study. Oh, I've got to break open that book that's been collecting dust for five years. We we need to stop looking at tests as something we want to avoid because when, when God is testing us, then we know God has a purpose for us, and he is crafting us, molding us into something better. And But also, how often, when we take a test, how often have we had that one question that we thought we answered right and then we missed? There's always, usually, even if if you get them all right, then you're surprised you got this one right. But there's always at least one question you're surprised you got right. Or, on the opposite, you're surprised you got it wrong. And you're like, I thought I knew that answer. Well, guess what? When you... um, when you go back and you research and you find the answer, you're like, oh, that's what it is. And that's another thing about how God is doing when he tests the mind. He is testing you to see, hey, where is your mind not filtering? Where is your mind not... Are you letting some stuff in that you shouldn't be letting in? Are you... Are you have a mind that is set upon my ways or upon your ways, on the physical ways. That's one way that God will test you. And even if you read the rest of 1710, um, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. When when God tests us, sometimes we're going to see the results, and we may not be pleased with them. And sometimes we'll be surprised and we'll we'll be happy with them. Don't look at tests as you want to avoid them because in the end, they're for your benefit. And then kind of now we're going to switch over into kind of the... think of, Put yourself in the mind of a biblical times person. And when you... As you're... Okay, I'm a biblical times person. What, do you, what organ of the body do you think... Those people thought the emotions, the personality. What organ do you think they, they thought that came from? Anybody got any ideas? Carl? Close, but not quite. Anybody else? Mm, we're getting close. Anybody else? Actually, no. The answer is um, gastrointestinal. We're getting there. The kidneys, actually. And I don't know how they figured that out back in the old days, but they thought the kidneys was where your emotions, your affections, that's where it all came from. But in their mindset, they viewed the kidneys as they didn't know where really it was in the body. It was one of those hidden, deep organs. But just as, um, let me ask you this, what is the function of our kidneys? Filter, exactly. They realize that the kidney is a filter. 
and just um, our mind is also a filter. So, so they were thinking, hey, I've got to have a clean filter in order to work for God. And even though they didn't have our modern medicine, they knew that the kidneys performed an important function. And just also, as we know the function of our kidneys, how often do we see, even in our modern times, people destroy their kidneys? Alcoholism, abuse of drugs, and other things. We can do the same thing with our spiritual lives. If we smother ourselves in the world, even if we're not sinning, but we smother ourselves in like hobbies, uh, our desires of what we want to do, all of a sudden that kidney is going to be like, there's nothing good coming in. It's all just the world stuff, and, and the kidney shuts down. It doesn't function. And you've only got two, so we have got to maintain, we've got to keep putting in healthy stuff into our mind, because if we don't, then we will soon not have a filter, and God will really have to come in and perform surgery. And that's an, another thing. What are we letting through? I mean, take self-evaluate. What are you letting through that the Lord would say, that's, you shouldn't be letting that through? Are you using me to filter that, or are you using yourself? I know a lot of times we go through our day-to-day -day life and we cut kind of our standard saying, hey, I'll accept this, or no, I won't accept that. But remember, that's your standard. Are you using God's standard? If you use God's standard, I'm fairly certain you will not be letting a lot of stuff in that you are letting in now. So just keep that in mind. You've got to use God's standard as what you let into your life and what you reject. Now, another, another thing here that I want you to understand, and I don't know the condition of all your hearts tonight, but since we're looking at God as our filter, do you even have him as your filter? And I want us to look at Acts 1 for a moment, please. And see, what I want to go over here in Acts 1 is that for those who are Christians, I'll call it one of the gifts that God gives us is he gives us the Holy Spirit. Here we have in Acts 1, let's see here, 1, 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then also if you go down to verse 8, the Lord says again, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the uttermost parts of the earth. So that, that's a key question I'm asking all of you tonight and even some of your friends and family. Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? And by extension, do you have the Holy Spirit? Because if you don't have Jesus Christ, then you don't have his, his Holy Spirit in your life cleansing you and filtering your life, telling you, hey, this is not good for you. A lot of times you hear people say, the the Word of God is just a bunch of rules and regulations. Well, the reason we have, for the most part, rules and regulation is to keep us safe. Why do we drive on the right side of the road? So you don't hit the person coming on the left. Why do you always stay within the, don't go over the yellow lanes? Well, another one is not, not to get a ticket because you don't want to pay the fine. But that's why we have warnings, we have cautions, and that's why God gave us his Holy Spirit is to say, this is not good for you. And when you don't use the Holy Spirit, even as a Christian, then you're just setting yourself up for failure and just letting in all that world, that sin in your life. So I cannot stress enough, you've got to use the Holy Spirit because God will give as much as you want of him. And the more you ask, the more God will give. So please, don't miss that fact. But even though when we're saved, we get the Holy Spirit, we can get that Holy Spirit in our, our souls dirty. And please turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.19. And this one's real short, but it has a very impactful statement. Do not 
quench the Spirit. Even as Christians, we get the Holy Spirit. Like I said earlier, if we set up our daily priorities as, I want to satisfy myself. I want to go out. I'm tired of serving the Lord. I want to go out into the world. That's what, that's what, this is how we quench the Spirit, is when we do that. Hit the fans, guys. And just, anyways, but uh, think about it, quenching. You think about a fire. You dump water onto it to extinguish it, to smother it. That's what we do as uh, believers if we're not following the Holy Spirit, if we're not following God's guidance. We start taking our mind, our filter, and think of it like as... You take that filter and you dunk it in mud. That filter can no longer work because there's no air getting it to it. Or even you're like, oh, I'll just throw it in there and bring it right back out. Well, guess what? The filter's dirty now. It can't work as efficiently. And that's exactly what we do with our lives and sin. We have to work harder and we don't really, we don't reach the full potential God wants to us because we have sin in our life. So just as you can quench the Spirit you can get your filter dirty, you can smother it, and you're no good to God. What you're looking for is clean. You're looking for a clean filter. You're looking for a clean mind, a clean heart. And guess what? I know a lot of times, when you think about it this way. Think about your vacuum filter for a second. You get it brand new from the store. It's all nice and clean, white, pristine. You use that thing one time. Even if you try and clean it out, it's still got specks of dirt all over it. You're like, it's not cl- quite as clean even from the factory even after you clean it. But God, he makes us back to perfect, pristine, factory white. We are clean, but we have to ask and we have to forgive, and we have to ask for forgiveness. So that's what the importance of keeping your mind clean, setting your priorities, is to be usable by God and to do the best for him, we have got to keep sin out of our lives, keep our mind clean. I know it's hard. Every, every thought, every second of our lives is a struggle. But guess what? The more we fight, we set our priorities for God, we set ourselves up for success, we should get in that habit of being like, and we should be doing it less. We'll still be capable of doing it, but the more we set up our priorities saying, I am going to serve God today, I am going to strive to be useful to him. It's going to become second nature, and you don't, won't even realize you're doing it. But you will realize, I'm not experiencing those temptations anymore. Why? Because you're setting yourself up to be, I want to serve God today, not myself. And then finally, one of the things I love about the Bible is that God always gives us examples. And we're like, how do we do this? How do I keep my mind clean so I can serve God? And, excuse me, but this is the best example ever. Jesus Christ did this for us. And go ahead and we'll turn to, well, you can turn and look. It's both in Mark 11 and John 2. This is where Jesus Christ is cleaning out the temple from the money changers. And what you see here is he had to do it twice. They, the money changers came back. And you know as well as I do, in our world today, if there's a place to, be, to, to make money, people will go there to make money. And the money changers, they were thinking practically, but they weren't thinking spiritually. They were thinking, it's Passover, a lot of people are going to be in there, and they're all going to the temple. Just like those like all the candy bars in the checkout lane, they were, they were all right there at that choke point, being like, hey, you want to get a lamb easy? You don't have to go home and grab one, go get a turtle dove. We'll sell one to you. Oh, yeah, it's 100% markup. But that's what they were thinking, and they didn't, did not think one, one in, inch about what God was thinking. And I want to... Now, take your minds, and again, put yourself as a person in biblical times. 
back in the New Testament and think of yourself as a family member go, going to Jerusalem on Passover. You're getting your kids set up. They're like, they're all excited. Hey, we get to go to Jerusalem. Hey, we get to see our uncles and aunts. We get to spend the night over their house. We get to play whatever games they play. The kids are all excited. Mom's, mom's thinking, okay, need to have food for the trip. Need to make sure we corral the kids, bring the chloroform just in case. Um, no, you cannot do that here. That's just an extreme joke. But uh, get the kids, make sure they're organized. We don't want bandits to get to them. Who knows how far they're coming. They could be going by boat. They could be walking for weeks, for months at a time just to get to Jerusalem. And she's thinking that. The dad's thinking, okay, how much money do I need to um, set aside for this trip? Do we have enough? Do all the kids here, do we count them all? Okay, do we have the donkey, the camel, the goat, all the stuff, the sacrifice, whatever? That's what he's all thinking. Now think, okay, we're organized, we're ready to go. Now you're making the trip up to Jerusalem. You're fighting off the bandits, you're fighting off other people that are trying to get to Jerusalem. And then you finally, you cross that hill and you're seeing Jerusalem. Everybody's excited. It's like, it's like when you take your family to a theme park and all of a sudden they see the rides and everybody's like, Oh, great, we're almost there. I can see it. And everybody's got that excitement. Now you've got to get to the temple. First, you've got to go through the gate, and now you're fighting through everybody trying to, everybody's trying, everybody's coming to Passover. All the Jews are coming for Passover. So you're now bumping into everybody. You're like, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, oh, there's a camel down in the center lane. I've got to go over here. It's, traffic is a mayhem, so you Finally, you get through the gate. And now you say, okay, let's go to... Now, And you know, as soon as you get through, like, the gates of a theme park, all the kids are saying, we want to go ride something. We want to go ride. Like, okay, let's go get them a ride. Or in this case, we want to go see the temple because it's the key defining feature of Jerusalem. So you're pushing your way up to, up to Jerusalem. You are doing your best to get them there, get them there quickly, and all of a sudden you realize... We lost our sacrifice. Where did our sacrifice go? And you're like, oh, no. And then you're like, oh, wait, we can get sacrifices up at the temple. So you get, get up to the temple, and all of a sudden you realize they're overcharging, but you still got to get one. You're fighting through other customers. You're trying to corral your kids. Oh, no, there they go. You, fi- you finally get your, get your sacrifice ready, and you can barely get through. There's money changers everywhere. There's other people. You finally get there. Now, let me ask you. Are you in any mood to worship at this point? No, you are tired, you are exhausted. Worship is the last thing on your mind. That is exactly the same of what Satan does to us when he fills our mind with the world. Just think about when you're trying to come here for for worship service tonight, Wednesday, or you're trying to get ready for Sunday morning. Satan throws everything at you all through the week to fill your mind with junk so you, your mind is nowhere near on worship. And I know in, in the word of the Lord, Jesus was throwing out the money changers because he said that he turned it into a den of thieves. It was no longer a house of prayer. Because, I mean, when those people got in there, it's supposed to be a solemn place. It's supposed to be, if you're hearing anything, it's only with the sacrifices going. But all you're hearing is all these, like, I don't know what they use for change machines or anything like that back then, but you're hearing all that stuff going on. You have all these distractions, and all you want to do is worship God. That's the same thing Satan does to us when we try to worship God today. He tries to distract us. He tries to make it so hard to get through that... We are, the temple is the last place we want to be. And if these are people that have come before, they're even more so because they're, they're just thinking about last year, the trip, and they're like, I don't want to go here again. I'm only doing this because it's a requirement. That's what Satan does. He clogs our mind with all this world stuff, even if it's not sin, but still he clogs it up with worthless stuff to where we don't want to worship God at all. And that's probably one of the things that was making Jesus angry 
Not only is this a den of thieves, not only have you robbing the people, you are preventing the people I want to speak to the most on the most, one of the most sacred times of the year, Passover, and you are putting them in such a mind where they're not going to even think about me. Put yourself in God's position. You think you might be a little pissed off at this point? So, as only Jesus Christ can do, he cleaned out the temple. And he can do the same thing for you. He can clear out the world from your mind. You might have to do a jackhammer to do it if there's a lot of stuff in there. But he can clear out your mind so that all that comes in is him. He can. His power is so great, even if we think we're so far gone, as long as we turn to him and ask for his forgiveness to restore that bond, Jesus Christ and the Lord, they can do it. But we have to ask, because we have free will. And that's a very dangerous thing, that free will. That's why we're here today. Adam decided to exercise free will, and he exercised it wrongly. So we can ask him about that one uh, when we get up there, if he's up there. But um, that's, that's what Jesus Christ does. And... In, in today's society, when we have so many distractions, when we are constantly fighting with the world, when we're trying to get our family, raise our families, when we're trying to worship God, when we're trying to have a successful career, whatever that is, that's what we have, we have, to, that's what we have to do when I said in Romans, or Paul said in Romans 8, are you setting your minds on the flesh, on the world? or all you're setting it on Christ. Because if you set that priority in the morning, I'm going to focus on setting God. It won't guarantee that you will, but you'll put yourself on a path to be like, I have a higher chance of fulfilling that goal that I want to do. And then, one of the, this comes from Pastor John Keelan. He was my youth pastor a long, long time ago. He gave me some of the best advice I ever heard. Don't put yourself in a position where you have to make a decision. If there is an area in your life where you are prone to sin, don't go there if, I know this is an example, but if you always walk out of the grocery store with a bag of candy, don't go down the candy aisle. You can't pick up the candy, well, unless it's whatever. You can't pick up at least a bag, you can only pick up a bar. But uh, if, if there's something that is tripping you up and it's in a certain location, don't go near that location. Go away from it. Go around. Yeah, it may take you, more, more than, take you five minutes more to get your, t- your location, but what is more important, serving God or expediency? Because in the end, remember, God will look at our life and he's going to grade us regardless if we ask him, ask him into our life or even if we didn't, because still the unsaved are going to be judged. It's going to be much worse for, the, for those guys, but they are going to be judged, and we are going to be judged even as Christians. So that's, that's the question you have to ask yourself. What do I want to satisfy today? Do I want to satisfy the Lord Or do I want to satisfy myself? And as you have the filter of the Holy Spirit in you, you've got to realize that filter is perfect. But if you start taking your life and start driving through the mud, start smothering it with the world, then it's not going to work as well until you stop going to those places and clogging it. You have got to... As, as we've heard before, live your life for purity. It's hard. I'll admit, it's hard. But what's, what's the end goal? Remember, Christians, we have to play the long game. If you're living in the world, you're, play, you're playing the short game. But Christians, we have to play the long game, and you have to decide, do I want that eternal reward, or do I want that temporary re- reward right now? That's the choice we have to make every day. So, 
as we're, as we're coming to an end tonight, um, as we go out to our groups, there's a couple of questions that I want you to ask yourselves. What is restricting your access to God tonight? Is there something in your life that is clogging up your filter that if you self-examine, you're like, this is keeping me from serving God, even if it isn't a sin? What is, what is restricting your access to God tonight? Here's another one. Is your mind so cluttered with the world, God has to use a drill, a jackhammer to get your attention? or even get some of the Lord into you. That's pretty simple. If you look at your life and you think, what am I thinking about? Just do a a self-examination. What am I thinking about 80% of the time? Am I thinking about work? Am I thinking about uh, fulfilling my desires? Or am I fulfilling or thinking about God? You've got to do that self-examination. And for some... Do you even know if you have God's filter? Are you a child of God? Because Jesus Christ on that cross paid the perfect price to fulfill God's commandments. And and all we have to do is ask for repentance of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ and he will come into our lives. That is a promise. And with that comes the Holy Spirit to guide our lives because if you don't have the if you if you're not a child of God, then your filter is whatever you make it. I mean, some people who aren't saved have very good filters, but guess what? If it's not the Holy Spirit, if it's not God, it's not enough. It's God's it's God's way or the highway. I know that's harsh, but our God is a God of standards. You can't change that. So And I am so grateful that in this day and age of all this change of, I'm not going to get into those political terms, but uh, where everybody's trying to change the definition, I am so thankful that God has remained the same. Aren't you? So, and then here's another one for you. Are you deliberately going to sin because you are prioritizing the world over God? Self-explanatory. What are you prioritizing in your life? And finally, are you regularly examining your lifestyle to see if it is God-honoring or world-pleasing? JP is kind of leading, and Steve are leading the BCF course. That is an excellent resource. Even if you're not going through the course, it is an excellent resource to do that self-examination. Not self-condemnation, because we can do that very easily. But that critical, objective self-examination be like, where are my shortcomings? Am I, is God testing me and I'm not even realizing it? But that's what you have to do is every so often do a self-examination and be like, be honest with yourself and be like, if I'm a child of God, what am I letting in my life? That the Lord would say, why are you letting this in? It's not what I have for you. So, as we're going to split up in our groups, give you a little extra time, um, but sorry I didn't post these questions up, but just talk with your groups and do that self-examination. Do that self-examination and just ask yourselves, or even say, what are some ways to trip yourself up, or what are some ways to set yourself up for success in the morning that you are God-honoring? Let's pray.